So today is two lectures. This one is fairly short. The next one is very long and it's a bit ridiculous. We're going to go through all of advanced statistics in an hour and a half. But uh, this one is pretty uh, straightforward, I would say. Um, yesterday we were talking about subtraction, MVPA, encoding models, R oh sorry, subtraction, MVPA, RSA, and then encoding models. Um, this one kind of belongs off on its own planet. And so it makes sense that we covered it. Where's my clicker? I can't find my clicker. Right. Oh, I left it over here. So um, that, and this is, uh, and the jargon differs, but I think functional connectivity is probably the most standard and most appropriate term for these flavor of analyses. And I'm sure you've heard of it, but I'll just start from the beginning. To boil it down to the basics, I think it's really just at the heart of it, and I'm going to use say correlate. Of course, there are other ways to measure association, but 99% of what's out there is a correlation. Hopefully, you know what that is. I guess correlation is like Pearson's correlation, typically, ranges between negative one and one. You think of like a scatter plot if the dots are highly tight, tightly related, that's like a high correlation, so near one. And then if it's just random dots, it's zero. Anyway, so the, the heart of functional connectivity is to correlate activity. So if we're talking about fMRI, we're talking about time series data, typically, or beta weights, depending on how you set it up. So you're going to correlate responses you find in one spot, so a voxel or a region or whatever, with what you observe elsewhere. And I will allude to, I mean, you can do this actually with two separate measurements. So like collect one run and collect another run, or even collect one run from one subject and collect the same run from a different subject. Those are have other names. So at the heart of it, they're all just like correlational. But uh, in this case, we're talking about within, you know, simultaneous measurements. So you sit in the scanner and typically you're doing resting state. So you're recording activity here and here at the same time. And then you look at their time series and you just correlate them. Right. And that, I mean, it's pretty simple. And, but really this is the heart of everything. And then people go off and start doing more and more complicated things. And as I mentioned, it's typically done 95% of the time out there, at least in the fMRI literature, is with resting state. So you stick the subject in and you basically tell them, keep your eyes open, but just stare at the screen. And one caveat is people will often fall asleep and people know this and this is a major controversy. Um, and, and, that, and that term you will see in the literature RSFC. You'll just see that acronym all the time. And it's just the application of this type of analysis to that type of data. Okay. Um, this was the seminal study from 1995 and it took many years actually for it to catch on. So what's happening is our usual little axial structural volume and then we have two little ROIs that someone drew over motor cortex. And what this plot is showing is just time series from these two averaged across the ROI. So we have a red and blue trace, y-axis is percent bold. Uh, this is uh, five minutes of data, it looks like. And we're just looking at the data and the, I mean, the core observation is they're extremely similar. And so you can take these and correlate them. It'll be probably 0 0.8 or 0.9 correlation. And this is at rest. So, I mean, if the subject was doing this, this motor cortex, then obviously we would see correlations, but theoretically they were just doing nothing with their limbs. Um, and so this is spontaneous activity or resting state activity. And one m minor observation is, you know, because bold is a hemodynamic measure, we're not talking about the fine time scale. We're talking about after convolution with HRF and the frequencies that you can get at, after you do that are quite low. So one, so sorry, 0.1 to 0.01 hertz, give or take. So that's like one cycle per 10 seconds up or 100 seconds. So that's extremely slow ups and downs in the bold response. So um, this was the core observation and then it took a couple of years for it to kind of take off. As I mentioned there, um, it doesn't really matter what units you correlate and people do all sorts of things, different flavors of functional connectivity. So you, one flavor of this is seed based. So the seed is like one voxel. So you just take that voxels time series and you just correlate that time series with the time series everywhere in the data set. So like across the entire volume. 
and then you get essentially a map, like a map of correlation values. And you can look at it and you'll find in your volume, like some regions are highly correlated with the seed and other regions are like weakly. Um, so that's one flavor. Another flavor is take an entire region of interest. Exactly where you get those regions is up to you and there's all sorts of different ways you can go about it, but you can do it at the ROI level. And that is depicted here. So this is our, some sort of inflated brain, lateral, right? Lateral, two hemispheres, there's the medial view. Uh, this little carving up uh, has to have been delivered by some method, but it doesn't matter how we, it doesn't matter for this example. And so what's happening is the time series has been averaged across each parcel. It's just another word for ROI. A parcel implies like, like a tessellation, like you actually divvy up the whole thing into little things. So what we're seeing here is just, it's just a, you know, rows by columns. Each element is just the correlation between one particular parcel and some other parcel. And the point is there's structure here. It's not like random looking noise, but there are clear um, spots where there's highly high correlation. So this square here is, I guess, higher than blue. <laughs> it's not that high. It's like 0.3. Um, and so apparently these region, these parcels are, highly correlated with one another and you can see where this is going they're like forming a network of things um, anyway so that's just another flavor of doing this um, and and I should mention resting state functional connectivity is huge I mean some of you know this but it's 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 like bigger than cog I don't know whatever you would call us mostly it's it's huge um, and yet another flavor is and I of a figure for this. It's not, it's kind of interesting, but I'll just describe it in words. Um, you can take some resting state data at the voxel level, say, and then essentially try to use, uh, derive from the data the proper parcellation scheme. So the idea being, let's say you're a voxel here and you compute your correlation with everyone, and then you kind of locally, you might expect neurons locally kind of do the same thing or maybe are correlated for whatever reason. As you move around locally, you know, the pattern of the map of correlations is probably not going to change much, but eventually it's going to look very different. If you like move from V1 to LO or, you know, parietal cortex going to motor cortex at some point, insofar that there's a latent structure in this data set, you know, this, this pattern of correlation is going to change. And so you can derive a devise an algorithm some method to essentially cluster. This is basically clustering, like find which voxels are kind of similar to one another with respect to their correlational structure. And then if you devise such an algorithm that you can apply it and then you might generate something like this. In fact, that, that's what these people did. So as for the validity of that, that's a whole nother uh, question. And of course you, there's many different ways to cluster, but that, this is something that is done in the field. Cool, so a couple of things about this. It's still not clear, I don't think, to me, and probably not to many of you, what does this all mean? Um, it's been long known that these functional connectivity results are themselves correlated with this other thing, so structural connectivity. So typical example is from diffusion. So we haven't talked about diffusion, but basically you take diffusion weighted measurements of the brain, which are sensitive to the diffusion directions of water, which basically are constrained by the axons. And you can derive axonal connections or white matter connections. And then you can construct one of these connectivity matrices that come from a completely different modality, right? The, each element can be like, how often does one uh, voxel or region uh, connect to another via white matter tracks? Uh, you'll hear more about this from Boss, I assume. Anyway, so you can construct one of these structural connectivity matrices and then correlate two matrices together. And, you know, it's been shown that they are correlated. I mean, it's not, actually not super highly correlated, but they, there's, a, there's a relationship there. It's non-zero. Um, so that is probably a good thing. So this is suggesting, you know, these functional connectivity observations are probably reflecting to some degree actual physical connections. Um, another observation um, is that connectivity during rest is very similar if you calculate connectivity while the subject is engaged in something. So looking at stimuli, thinking about something, moving their limbs insofar that you can do that in the scanner. Um, 
and it's shockingly similar. So you can blast away with stimuli and whatever and construct one of these connectivity matrices and you look at them and you look at a rest matrix and it's almost hard to tell them apart. So what, again, it's unclear, I think, I'm sort of an outsider to this, but I, I think it's still an open question what, what that really means or what's going on, you know. So what, what one view, for example, on one extreme is like, a lot of this is some structured noise that has nothing to do with um, neural activity, let's say, and that noise exists in both a rest paradigm as well as your task paradigm. That, that would be a very pessimistic view. I, I don't, it's not, it's definitely not as extreme as that. Um, a different view, which is very optimistic, is what you do when you don't do anything is like what you normally do in, 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 in task situations. Like it's a reflection of um, what typically happens. So like, let's take the, the motor example. Your left and right motor cortex appears to have correlations during the rest, maybe because we often in real life kind of bi-manually do stuff. So these uh, regions have sort of inherent propensity to want to talk to one another, something like that. And one last observation here. Um, as I said, this world is huge and maybe it, it, because it has very clinical focus. So, you know, these data are very easy to get resting state. You can get like 10 minutes of data and it can have some predictive value. And that's actually where this is going. You can take the data, do this basic pairwise correlation stuff, and then treat that thing as a thing about the person. And there's, you know, fingerprinting metaphors out there. Like everyone has somewhat slightly different uh, connectivity matrices. And then you can start taking that and like using it as a marker for other things and start correlating that with other aspects of the person. So like behavioral measures of various flavors or use that and start comparing that across people, disease states, things like that. Um, and definitely there's a lot of people doing that type of stuff. So probably you're wondering, maybe depending on your point of view, like what does this have to do with cognitive neuroscience? But um, it is an analysis that you can do with data. And certainly there is some crossover. Certainly people, you can do this type of analysis on task data, on visual data, on an actual experiment. And people do do that to some degree. Um, so there's some intersection of these, 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 these worlds. Okay, um, and yeah, this was the point of like, and this is me kind of raising that question. It can still be useful for stuff. It's not completely bogus. I mean, if you treat it, it depends on what you say about it. And that's, whoops, um, a, the concept of biomarker is like, well, it, it's, it's something that's reliable. You can get it from the person. I don't know what it means in terms of their cognitive processing, maybe, um, but it can still be useful. So it kind of depends on what you do with it and what you say about it. Okay, that's kind of a brief intro. We have more on this, but I want to stop briefly just to kind of get your triplets going and thinking about resting state. But you love resting state? What? Oh, I was mentioning using resting state as like a nuisance regressor. So it's not test specific, but it's going to show up as like uh, well, how would you use it as a noise thing? Like you get some resting state data and then you yeah. go. But that's the devil's in the details. How, how does that work? I think that's what it, that's I mean, tricky. Like, to, to, to get some separate data. Like, you want to get it out of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. If you're showing something well, like that, you just have like some of the resting state in you know, the session and then just use those rungs. But it's, it's specific patterns that you want to make. Yeah, it's like a stochastic signal. You don't, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. And if you don't record, that's exactly what GLM denoise does, by the way. It's just, it does it on the same data set because it only makes sense on the same data set. 
mean, you could, it does give you a justification for Pick it out more. All right, we'll 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 pick it up in one minute. Uh, let's see. There are lots of thoughts happening there. Let's hear it. <laughs> ah, beta series. So this is, you have a time series and you do some first pass GLM to get amplitudes and then you get a series of amplitudes and then you do correlations of those across voxels. Right. Yep. Uh, first of all, if we study branch elasticity and shear metric, and we use the as a biomarker for plasticity. Yeah. Should we go for structural and full function connectivity in terms of studying elasticity? What I mean, any of this could be markers for plasticity. I guess it's all all fair game. Um, I mean, you have to worry, of course, about, you know, you scan them for 10 minutes one day, they come back the next day. I mean, there are all sorts of factors that might change. Time of day is the thing people think about in terms of the bold response. They wiggle more one day than another. Um, so there are many confounds that might show up in such data. So they still think it's uh, more useful to their construction than they do, because they don't be impact too much. Yeah, probably less so, but you know, still head motion is a thing. <laughs> during long diffusion scans or T1s, you know, small head motions during a T1 will show up as artifacts and that's a difference in the data, but of course it's not meaningful. Um, but yeah, in general, it's less susceptible than compared to functional stuff. Cool, um, this group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how do you visualize it? Yeah, we'll see an example. I mean, it, it, it's the same as any of the data sets that you've been visualizing. You can look at it like a volume or a surface or whatever you like. Do people expect to see like a chunk of data set that you see in one visualization? Uh, expectations are hard, but in general, people do observe blobology. You see little blobs here and there. Oh, um, well, in practice, things do look smooth and at the large scale, so you won't find like a donut. Like, you know, all of these voxels are highly correlated with something, and then there's like a magical vox in the middle that doesn't. That's atypical, I think. Um, if your question is like, what would you do if you did see that? It, that's I mean that's a hard I mean it depends on your theory of the brain is that noise is that real do you maybe you want to if it's something you're interested in you can cut it out and like separately analyze that little island maybe not like in the center but on the zoom like in the edge of the, the documentation that was slowly yeah so at, yeah at some point the blob dies so then you get to the issue of thre thresholding like how do you it's a bit unless you have some fancier method it's going to be arbitrary where you cut the blob and that, that certainly is an issue for these types of analyses. Any other um, thoughts? Uh, something was I read about so the functional connectivity that it's hard to, for a person in that they to perform such the task, not to think about anything. Uh, yeah, that's, that, yeah that, that's an obvious uh, thing, yeah. I'll, I'll mention that on a previous slide. But um, what does the field think about that? Or 
are you asking what do I think about that? Um, people have different views. Some uh, one view is like it's such a latent thing and it hardly changes with tasks. Like we don't care. That's like one view. Um, another view is it's complete bollocks. Like if you, it's an uncontrolled experiment. This is crazy. Like we have no idea what the subject is doing. Your results are completely affected by their daydreaming state or their sleepiness. And maybe that's the biomarker. That, that's kind of an extreme view, but yeah, there's different views out there. Yeah, people have def people have definitely done reproducibility measurements and analysis, and it is stable. I mean, up to a point, like you have to get a certain amount of data, and then if you repeat at least that amount of data, and you look at the two sets of results, it is stable. Of course, the question is how stable, and you know. But uh, yeah, there are definitely papers that have looked at that. And you know, there are some data sets where it's like ridiculous. People get, Russ Baldrick has like 100 hours of resting state on him. Uh, so you could download that data. And, and, and that data set is one of the papers that have quantified how much data do you need before effectively your estimate of the effect size, the correlation is stable. And there's a curve, right? I don't know, three hours, four hours. Beyond that, it's basically unchanging. Yep. Okay, so a little more on functional connectivity. You know, you start with those basic ob observations and people take it, crank up the, the game here. So networks. So this is exactly what you were um, getting at. So let me just explain this figure. Um, this is from a classic paper, I guess, from a, a decade ago almost. Lateral and medial view, we're using color to color code putative networks. I'm gonna wave my hands to mean like scare quotes. Um, so B is one seed, let's say. So B is just this set of plots. And so this is the result of taking that seed and doing the correlation with the rest of the brain. And so we're really just looking at one map of correlation but different viewpoints, right? And of course it's been thresholded and you know exactly how you threshold that's a little questionable, but if you believe this, I mean, it's kind of super high there and then it has some patterns and it falls off eventually and some large part of the brain is not really correlated with this one spot. So you get some sort of map of results. And then you do the same for all the other seeds here. So C and F, so that's C and that's F. And these are different. If you can try to compare visually what uh, is going on, I mean, these are different to some degree. And then basically on basis of looking at all of these different fractionations of the cortex, you can then make a claim as to, well, actually the brain is largely highly correlated within some regions and then you visit a different region and then they talk to other regions. So it's kind of a way of divvying up the brain into networks. So that's definitely a huge concept in this uh, field. Okay, so once you have this kind of mindset, you can take it even further and start doing graph theory, theoretic measures. I, again, I'm, not, I'm definitely not an expert in any of this. And this slide was from Katerina Raton, who some of you probably know. Um, and the basic idea is the following. So remember the connectivity matrix that you saw a few slides ago? That was actually at the parcel level. Um, a question is what granularity do you do things at? Do you do it every voxel? Do you do it on the surface, every vertex, do you do it in parcels? Do you do it on you know, ROIs that you really believe based on functional localizers or something? But whatever your granularity is, you take that connectivity matrix and you binarize it. So you decide, oh, some correlations are high enough to count. Other ones are like, and eh, that's probably not that important. You just binarize it, so you have zeros and ones. Zero means no connection, supposedly, and one means connection, and then, you can then interpret like a graph, right? So without getting into details yet of these things, you just represent little parcels or voxels or ROIs, whatever, as nodes that are connected by edges. And then you can draw a graph that represents the connection matrix that you constructed on basis of your 
presumably resting state, but not just resting state um, data, and then doing the correlational analyses. So once you get these graphs, then you can go to you know, mathem mathematics, real mathematics, and they have different graph theoretic properties of different graph structures, like I forget all the terms, uh, small worldness or hub, like some of these uh, nodes are deemed special. So let's see, connectors, these nodes are special because they kind of connect different clusters of other uh, nodes. So there's all sorts of uh, rich properties of graphs that you can then quantify given the empirical results. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Oh, yeah, right, sorry, that point. Um, so as we've already kind of alluded to, I just wanna list at least the ones that I come to mind for me, and maybe you can think of more of like, problems is pretty strong, but I'll say problems, as opposed to limitations. They're like subtle differences of terminology. <laughs> so first, no particular order, um, and this is obvious, uh, the problem of um, kind of hidden causes. So imagine you have two regions, A and B, and you find that they're correlated. Well, one possibility is they actually don't directly talk to one another, but rather there's some other region that talks to A and talks to B, and that apparent connection between A and B was just there because of this other cause, right? So, I mean, this is very obvious and well-known. And on basis of, say, resting state data alone, there's it's very hard to rule that out, I would say. So that's a major problem. Like, but of course, to play the other side, as long as you don't interpret your data as if you're getting actual connections, then it might be okay, right? Again, think of the biomarker. If you're just using it as a biomarker, you really don't care if it, there's an actual connection there, maybe. Uh, another problem. Um, a lot of people are trying to push directionality. So what that means is do spikes in this region A travel to B and cause it to have its own kind of computation spikes? So is there a directionality we can infer? It actually goes from A to B and not B to A. And the first thing that comes in mind is like maybe we can use time courses to do that. Maybe the lag between A and B is ever so slightly different, but fMRI is really slow on the order of seconds, and neural communication is really fast. So at least based on fMRI data, this seems, it would be miraculous maybe if it worked, um, but people are trying or have tried or have claimed that it works. Approaches like DCM, dynamic causal modeling, Granger causality approaches, whatever. Um, and so not only is the hemodynamics slow, but also there are delays in the HRF. So you know, how many seconds does it take blood to arrive in this part of the brain? If that number differs by like a tenth of a millisecond, sorry, a tenth of a second, <laughs> that's already larger probably than the communication delays between the regions. So that's a con confounding factor present in presumably all fMRI data. Uh, so that's an issue. Really? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. I'm thinking about the way you so I'm kind of hmm. very skeptical in general, but mm -hmm. people argue it doesn't necessarily correlate that the HRF shape differences between the regions hmm. and the delays. Yeah, should it? I know that there's a lot of people said otherwise. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. I'm going to chat about that. Um, another problem, and you may have heard this, it's pretty, it made news. Um, it's extremely susceptible to no boring sources of noise. So head motion, just a little head motion, like a millimeter movement, that affects all the voxels, right? It's like a global effect. And you might have the intuition, like this is gonna cause voxels to be correlated. Like all the voxels are gonna have a little bit of upward or downward uh, intensity fluctuation. And that will show up as connectivity. And there are other global noise sources. So if you hold your breath, the entire brain gets dark because if you hold your breath, you're withholding oxygen delivery 
And so all your pixels are gonna go down. <laughs> and that's connectivity. Um, so on and so forth. Uh, this was already discussed. What about cognitive stuff? Like the subject is not like in a steady state of statuesqueness. They are like thinking, they're probably twitching their fingers. They're like closing their eyes. Um, they're doing all sorts of things. And you can't control, well, you could try to control that, but then you start, be, then it starts becoming a cognitive neuroscience experiment, which is kind of interesting. Um, but if you don't do anything, you have this uncontrolled thing, the subject might do it differently the next time they come go in, different people might do it differently. There's all these like question marks, I feel. But again, to play the other side, it really depends on what you say about the data. Like you can get the data, and we did get the data for NSD. And just by getting the data, nothing's wrong yet. It's like what you do to the numbers, what you analyze it, and what you say about what you learn from that. That's the problem, in my view. Okay, so kind of wrapping up this part of it, what does this have to do with subtraction and MVPA and RSA and all this stuff? Um, one point is, it really is fundamentally different, I would say, from these kind of more cognoroe approaches. And maybe that's obvious, but all of the approaches we talked about yesterday were about understanding how cognitive stuff, stimuli, you know, cognitive manipulations, memory effects, whatever, how that stuff relates to brain activity. So it's like experiment to response, right? All of the approaches are about that. Whereas, you know, functional connectivity is on the surface of it, of course you could try to couple it with that, but on the surface, it's not about any of that. It's just about activity correlations with each other. And sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. You can build little networks out of that, but it doesn't say anything about the task paradigm. Unless you do additional links. I'm not saying you can't try to go there, but in its raw form, it doesn't do that. So that seems fundamentally different. Uh, another general point is like, it has in the field kind of shifted kind of the overall thematic focus to the fact that neurons have to talk to one another. Like, that's how your brain works. You, there's a whole <coughs> cascade of signaling from sensory receptors, association areas, motor outputs, and you know, neurons do connect to one another and that's how they get their uh, processing done. Right, and so that's a kind of a different mindset. Rewind to yesterday, like talking about subtraction and all this stuff, like none of that was in thinking about the brain like that. So a shift in thinking about or taking seriously connectivity, or sorry, communication between neurons or areas is, is new here. Uh, another major large issue is what do Cogneuro people do? Let me just say Cogneuro is non, connectivity people. Um, what do we do about it? Like we do our experiments and during, by the way, you know, we typically have rest periods and we didn't talk about this that, that much, but you, let's say you're starting to run and it's a visual experiment. You, you, pr you typically have periods of blank of just sit there please and just, you know, the scanner has some equal, it takes a few seconds for, and we didn't go over this, for the physics to kind of settle in. So there are some rest periods and then you do some task and you like make a judgment and you do your trials and then we typically have some more rest. So there is resting state in some sense during our experiments, during task experiments. But beyond that, I mean, theoretically these signals, these fluctuations, whatever their nature, they're probably happening during our experiment also, right? And so how do we orient ourselves towards that? One view is it's noise that I don't care about, right? It, I mean, this whole idea of averaging across trials, right? We got three trials during NSD for many analyses, we're just gonna average. Let's just say like, it was a little higher in this trial, a little lower in the next trial, that I don't want that, so I'm gonna average it out. That's kind of one stance towards it. Alternatively, you can treat those fluctuations as, it, they could be biologically meaningful for simple reasons and complex reasons. Simple would be like, you ask your subject to engage in a cognitive thing and like on a given trial, they do it more. Like they actually, the neurons actually were, um, you know, attention, you were attending more strongly or something, or your reaction time does vary from trial to trial. That's not noise, like the neurons actually took longer for whatever reason, 
So it's an actual signal that you might be interested in. So that's kind of the simple version. Um, and this is just an example of paper that kind of gets at that, linking it to perception. Like your perception varies from trial to trial. Why is that? Well, presumably it comes from the neurons. Okay, so probably the neural activity is varying from trial to trial. And so some people can be actually interested in those trial to trial fluctuations and that, that's, that's like the topic of study. So this is, you know, this is just an open question. There's no, people are interested in different things, but this is something to be considered when you think about stuff. One other kind of high level observation is, Yeah, um, so I just, I don't mean anything deep here. So if you, let's say you have an off period for 16 seconds, theoretically that's resting state. And theoretically, you know, the brain is fluctuating up and down. And then, you know, stimuli come on. It's probably the case that whatever the biological sources of those fluctuations were, they're probably also present during your task block. So what, what do you do about it? Or how, what's your stance towards this existence of those signals? That's, that's just the question I'm raising here. Uh, oh yeah, the presumption is certainly that it averages out, that it sometimes is up, sometimes is down, hopefully it's zero mean, on average it should be go to zero. Um, if it doesn't average out, then certainly that's a cause for some concern. Um, I plead ignorance, I don't know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the rest periods. Are you pointing out the rest periods in the task paradigm not aren't really rest sometimes yes. because this, is, right? Yep. Right. Or in those cases, it's probably going to be a mixture of what people think of resting state as well as your cueing cognitive activity. So it's some unholy mixture of stuff. Right. I don't know if any of you tried to rest for five minutes in a scanner. It's, it's weird. You like, it's almost like hallucinating sometimes, like you drift in and out of consciousness. Uh, another kind of high level point I just want to point out, it, this is more of like sort of an analytic view. Uh, it's like the reverse of RSA. Okay, so let's just go through ma matrix notation. And you have to like hand wave a little because we don't really have stimuli necessarily in resting state. But if X is a 2D matrix where you have voxels on the rows and different stimuli in the columns, which is what we just saw yesterday, right? Then you think of RSA as just X transpose X. So hopefully you know some matrix operations. So transposing this matrix just makes it stimuli by voxels. So if you multiply stimuli by voxels by voxels by stimuli, you get stimuli by stimuli. So transposing is just taking the dot product of each activity pattern to each every activity pattern. And the, taking the dot product is like correlation, basically. Ignoring the fact that you have to subtract the mean and normalize and all that stuff. So basically, to construct an RDM, a representational dissimilarity matrix, it's basically like this. And to do functional connectivity, it's just the same thing, but reversed. So X is voxel by stimuli. So here we, we would just be doing voxels by stimuli times stimuli by voxels, and then you get out voxels by voxels. So mathematically, these are like trivial uh, and simple things that people do to different types of data. And, use completely different words for different things, even though they're fundamentally almost the same. Um, and as I alluded to, it's not like functional connectivity lives really on a different planet. I mean, people, you can take a task paradigm and do functional connectivity and start looking at results. 
I would say what that means is tricky and I still haven't fully wrapped my head around it, but you can do it, right? You can measure how correlated our time series in different regions of interest that you're interested in during an experiment, during trials, during behavior, whatever. And some people do that. And I, I just want to mention one thing. So in vision, if you know about retinotopy and PRFs, which we talked about, um, so I guess the old paper now have, has uh, kind of explored the idea of taking resting state data and essentially finding PRFs. So the idea is, so in V1, you have small receptive fields. And in V2, you have also small receptive fields. They don't actually get that much bigger. But um, you might expect kind of a point-to-point -point correspondency. Right? So you have retinotopic organization of the whole visual field. And so you have a whole map on V1 of the world. And you also have a map in V2. You might imagine, and it is true, that the neurons kind of connect one-to-one. -one. So you know, they represent a small part of the visual field. And then they pass on their information to the next area who also represents that little part of the visual field. And so there's structural connections there and it shows up in functional data and you can get resting state measurements and derive those connections. And so that's this concept of connective fields. And then you can start mixing that with task paradigm. So one thing people have done is, um, I don't know what paper published it. Is it, I'm sure it's published, but basically um, let's say you know where V1 is in each of your subjects from whatever external data or, or whatnot, you get resting, um, sorry, you, yeah, I actually, you can do this with a stimulus or a resting state. So let's say you just do resting state. So nominally there's no stimulation going on. If you know where V1 is in that subject, you can derive these little connective fields to the next area, say V2, and essentially infer retinotopy in the next area given that you have strong belief that you know where V1's retinotopy is. And so you can do that with the resting state paradigm. You can also, also do it with a stimulus. So there's people who do this with movies. So you can have complicated movies that are stimulating everything and this and everything's getting stimulated in some complicated way insofar that this kind of V1 to V2 communication is always occurring. You can also you know, attempt to do this kind of connective field stuff to, to learn retinotopy given if, under assumption you know it in V1. So V1 is the base and you start uh, essentially deciding which V2. So you pick a voxel in V2, for example, and kind of learn which of the V1 voxels it's most correlated with. And that if it works well, then you immediately have an estimate of what its preferred location in the visual field is. So that's like a mixture of task and resting state. And it's, kind of, it's also a mixture of like the experimental approaches we saw yesterday, it's kind of a mix of all of this. Okay, so um, I think that's it for functional connectivity. So we'll do a brief breakout and then we'll reconvene and have some a little more discussion.